Like Hal said, I'm Sammy K, and this is a complete introduction to the Facebook development platform and specifically how to integrate Facebook into Laravel and have it not suck. Um, I officially do not work for Facebook, despite the fact that a lot of people think I do because I work a lot on the SDK uh, and wear Facebook shirts and stuff like that, but I don't work for Facebook. Now, the goal of this talk is just to get a general overview of the Facebook platform because there's a ton of information in this. Here's a, a little warning. There's 370 slides in this presentation, so I'm going to be flying through them real fast. But hopefully, hopefully it won't. It will all soak in perfectly. Don't worry. We'll we'll just get a general gist of what what we're going to talk about here. All right. Also, this talk comes equipped with awesome achievements, including one that you're getting right now for coming out. And you know what it is? It's an awesome Laravel Chicago sticker. And what you can do with it? See it right there. You can wear it right there. It looks nice on you. Oh, by the way, that's you. That's you right there. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with a slightly embellish, embellished history lesson. The year is 1736, and people wore funny bathing suits. And while they were swimming and frolicking about, they would try to solve riddles, including this one. This is a little town that had seven bridges here, 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 and right there. And the riddle was, can you cross all the bridges once and only once and not get stuck? So the idea is, if you started on this landmass and you cross that bridge, can you cross that bridge and then cross that bridge and cross that bridge, cross that bridge? And now you're stuck here, right? So maybe you could start on this landmass and cross that bridge. Maybe you can cross that one and that one and that one. Oh, but now you're stuck here. So the, the riddle was, can you do it? Um, nobody, was nobody could figure it out until this guy, Leonard Euler, pops in. This guy goes off, invite, invents an entire like sub-genre of discrete mathematics called graph theory, takes his newfound theory to this riddle, and he answers it, and the answer was, no. <laughs> no, you cannot cross all those bridges once and only once. Uh, and the way that he, he proved it was actually kind of really cool, but we don't have time to go into exactly why. Well, fast forward 268 years, and Facebook is born. I'll let you guys look at that picture for a little bit and see what's going on. So, I guess I should back up just a little bit here. What is graph theory? Well, it is something that describes relationships. So, for example, in this GIF, there's a, there's a number of things going on. So, if we were to describe what's going on in this GIF, oh, we're, before we get to that, uh, an example is guitars have strings and David likes pickles. These are relationships, right? These things are related to each other. And we use graphs to model these relationships. So, what kind of graph do we use to model these relationships? Do we use this kind of bar graph? Nope. What about this one? This one looks like a, a graph. Well, it's not the one that we want. So that one, that's not even a graph, it's a pie chart. Um, how about, oh wait, that's a kitty. That's, no, we don't use kitties, but they are cute though. So what kind of graphs do we use? We use these kinds. Those are the graphs we talk about uh, when we talk about graph theories. Now, here's a simple example of a graph. Notice, it's got dots and it's got lines. But this is graph theory and we can't use simple terms like dots and lines. We have to use fancy words like nodes and edges, but un unfortunately, they also have another word for nodes, which is vertices, so that might be kind of confusing. But for this talk, we're gonna use nodes, and you'll see a little bit wh um, why in a little bit. So the nodes represent real world things, right? And the relation between those things, the edge, um, that's what that represents, is the relation between those two things. Now, Facebook uses graph theory in their backend to represent their data, all right? And it's called the social graph. You may have heard it before. Now notice the keyword here, graph, just like in graph theory, the same type of graph. And that is so Facebook social graph. Now, by the way, this logo here is um, the open graph protocol logo. So it's a little different, um, and I'll explain that at the end if you guys um, care enough. To. So describing this, this GIF that we saw a little earlier with social graph, right? So just get it, just let that sink into your mind what's going on here for a second. All right, so if we had to describe this with a social graph, we'd create a node, we'll call it a user node, and we'll put the one of the guys in there, let's put that guy, we'll call him Jordan. We'll create another node for this lady here, and we'll call her Tatiana. Now, the relationship between these two individuals is that they're kissing. Now, notice kisses, is, and these are instances of kisses. So, Jordan could be kissing some other chick over here, and that could be represented by another line by the same kisses edge, right? All right, so here we got another guy. We're just going to call him Scott. Uh, and he's got a relationship with Jordan, and that is he's stalking him, or instances of stalking. There's an instance of stalking here. And Scott is also stalking, Scott is also stalking Tatiana. So there's the, there's the relationship between um, these two, which is the same edge, 
um, but it's related between two different um, nodes. So, Facebook, this pretty much, I guess, describes Facebook's model, like what happens in real life every day, right? People stalking people, people kissing each other, duck faces. All right, so let's see a more Facebooky example. You've probably seen this, maybe you've not. Um, this, is, this is actually coming from Facebook, um, where they uh, show there's a user node here, um, and the edge is that they're friends. Um, the edge here is that they're watching um, a node here, which is a, a movie, um, or they're listening to um, some kind of music. So this is how Facebook describes all the relationships on the social graph network. All right, so here's us, Laravel nerds. Here's them, social graph. How do we access their data, right? Well, here comes the, the graph API. And uh, this, this is the actual real logo for the graph API. I'm just kidding, I just made that. Um, but the graph API is what links us to uh, the, the social graph. Here's a little tangent, just, for, for, just so I don't make too many assumptions here. What is an API? It stands for Application Program Interface. And it specifies how software components interact. Now, you might be familiar with Laravel's uh, Query Builder API. So this is interacting with a table, and this is the API that we, you would use to interact with that table. Now, APIs can also exist over the HTTP protocol. For example, here, you make a request to silly.com. Um, it's a get request, and you're requesting this specific, what we call an endpoint. Right? So it's a user with ID 123. And that would, in turn, return some sort of uh, response code. In this case, it's 200 OK. It's returning a type of JSON. And that's the JSON representation of that, that user, that user node. So these are called <coughs> web APIs. The Graph API is a web API. And when you're working with APIs, you may have heard of terms like REST and HADIOS, which is a hypermedia constraint, which is a totally different talk, um, which is also part of REST, and uh, OAuth. And so, when in relation to the graph API, it's not RESTful. It doesn't, con it doesn't have hypermedia constraint concerns or anything like that, but it does use OAuth, and it's OAuth 2.0. It's a flavor of uh, OAuth. But you don't have to know that. That's the good thing. If you don't know what any of that stuff means, it's okay. It's all right, because there's, there's ways around that, and we're, we're going to get to that in a second. All right, so what happens is your Laravel apps asks the graph API for user 1, 2, 3. All right, and graph goes in the social graph network at Facebook and says, can I have user 123? And social graph returns that user node, and in the response, graph <laughs> will translate Scott into a actual JSON representation, something that can be used um, for other pieces of software, like your Laravel app. So here's the too long didn't read version of the graph API. This is a, this is a huge topic, so we're getting just a little bit on this. It lives here at graph.facebook.com. That's where you poke things. And I'll put all these links in the, like in the description on the YouTube video or, or whatever when I post it. It's versioned through the URL with the letter V and then the, the version number. 2.2 .2 is the current uh, version, the current latest version of Graph. And then you put your, uh, the rest of your URL request into that. And it's not RESTful. So any of the developers who are really rest to full lights will very, they, I hear and complain all the time. They're like, oh, Graph's not RESTful. Yes, it's not RESTful. So let's get over it and just learn it, all right? So it uses, a, a for, as I mentioned early, a, earlier, a flavor of OAuth2, and, but you don't have to know that. So everything on Graph, users, comments, and photos, these are all things that you'd see on Facebook, right? These are all nodes. Same example from Graph Theory, right? Yay, yeah, nodes. Euler's really excited because we're using the same ter terminology they were using back in the 1700s. Awesome. So these nodes have IDs associated with them, right? So, a little tangent about IDs. User IDs, specifically, are huge in Facebook. I mean, it makes sense, right? You got a lot of users, you're gonna have big IDs. A problem with this with, that people run into when storing their IDs in the database is they'll use just a normal signed int and they'll throw a, a Facebook ID in there. Problem is, signed ints aren't big enough to store the giant Facebook IDs you're gonna get. So what you need is an unsigned big int. I know this is a big tangent, but like this is a pain point that you will run into if you're not, if you're not looking out for it. The other thing, comments are associated with some kind of post, right? You're commenting on a post or a picture or something like that. You're going to get an ID that looks like this. It's going to have some number, an underscore, and then another number. They're concatenated IDs returned as strings. So make sure that when you're storing comments, you're not thinking, oh, it's an int. So you create a database table with an int, and then you throw underscore in there, and everything's freaking out. Um, so we can talk more about that later if you have questions about it. All right, so let's take a quick look at the Graph API request response cycle. Say we have a photo here with ID 4590. In, well, you'll make a request in our Laravel app to 
graph.facebook.com forward slash the version number forward slash the ID of our photo. And now here's the restful people popping in. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Shouldn't that be photos forward slash four or five ninety? We want a photo. So this is we should be describing the resource we want, right? Well, no, like I said before, graph's not restful. So we just put an ID there and it figures out that, oh, that's a photo, and it returns that node. Node uh, is represented in blue here. So if we wanted a list of nodes, say we wanted to get a list of comments or something like that, say, well, yeah, a list of comments, there we go. Uh, a list of likes, a list of photos, and an album, for example, these can be accessed from edges, just like in graph theory, right? The relationships between two nodes. And in the URL, they're represented right after the node. So this is the node ID, and this is the edge name here in graph, when we go to the graph API. So here's an example of what that would look like. Same photo example here, 4590. We want to get the comments on that photo. So the way we do that in the graph, uh, structure the graph URL, is that we put the node at the base, and then we ask for the comments edge. And this is a specific edge that's offered by the photo node, um, and there's more on this in the documentation. Um, I can't just put anything here. It has to be supported by the graph API. So when I hit that, I get a, a data, uh, a numeric uh, array, basically, if you want to think of it in PHP terms. And each one of these has a node that represents the comments. So uh, this data uh, is returned specifically in this uh, little, uh, the, the, the key called data. It's always going to be returned in the key called data. But if you're using one of the SDKs, you don't have to know that. Um, unless you're using the uh, uh, JavaScript SDK, which you probably will. All right, so nodes. They have fields and edges. We already know that they have edges, but fields are another attribute. They're, they're basically attributes on the fields. So the graph API endpoint reference um, can be found here at developers.facebook.com slash all that crap. I, the big important thing to remember throughout this entire talk is this URL right here. This one right here, developers.facebook.com. This is the, basically the entry point to everything you're going to want to do on the platform. If you have questions on anything, it starts really with this URL. And I'll, I'll add that URL to the description. So looking at a user node, let's get just some examples of some fields that might be on it. An ID, the first name, last name, name, which is actually just a concatenation of first name and last name, and email. Now notice email has a star next to it, and that's because it requires special permission. You have to ask the user special access to see their email address. You don't get it by default. Now also on the user node, um, we have edges. So we have albums, we can see the user's feed, the photos, friends, and picture. Notice picture has a star by it for the exact opposite reason. Because picture does not require any special access uh, or uh, permissions that you need from the user. However, those edges do. You, have to, you do have to ask special permission to read the, the, the user's feed or the photos. Oh, and a note on permissions, by the way. Uh, say I request this endpoint. Uh, user node one, two, three slash turtles. I want turtles. I want to see the user's total turtles. And then graph is like freaking out. It doesn't know what's going on. It, so it gives me this weird like error that I've never seen before. And then I'm like, what, dude, like, where, where are my turtles? And, okay, by the way, that, that's not a really valid uh, edge, I promise. Uh, so turtles um, is actually, we're going to say photos for this example. Uh, this is a legitimate endpoint uh, for a user, right? And I, I request it, and it gives me a 200 response and an empty data set, all right? And I know this user has photos, so I'm, like, kind of freaking out. So really what's going on here is that the user, uh, there's a user underscore photos permission that I need to ask for before that will return uh, the data that I want. And that happens when I ask the user to log in at the beginning. Now, notice, this is a 200 OK response. So to me, from an API, from someone who works with APIs, I'm 200, he's like, yeah, that was a legitimate request, and here's legitimate data back, right? Why isn't it like some kind of like authorization, you need permission response? Well, I think there's actually good reason for that when we start talking about like more advanced things like nested requests and things like that. But it is something to look out for. It's a gotcha. Oh, wait. Congratulations, you have just unlocked an, another achievement for learning graph. And what you get is a beautiful graph necklace. And I think you should just wear it with, proud, with pride there. Nice. So you're going to have a nice collection when you guys sleep here. All right. How do we access the graph API with a Facebook app? But first, more important thing, we can't just grab stuff off of Facebook's platform without them knowing something about us. we got to actually register as a Facebook developer. So what you can do is if you go, like I said before, this URL is appearing again, developers.facebook.com, right? You go there, and then at the top here, there's this little tab, if I'll zoom in so you can see it, My Apps, and then if you're not a Facebook developer yet, it'll say register as a developer. Then you click on that, and it'll pull up this little modal, and it's going to ask you to accept the terms and all that stuff. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are just used to software asking you to like accept the terms. It's like a book, you know, a whole book long, and you just mindlessly click accept and 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 you go on your way. 
Don't do that with the Facebook development platform. It will bite you and it's bitten me. Read the Facebook platform policy. Um, I have three important points about the, the platform policy. First, you just gotta read the, the Facebook platform policy. It's just, it's a must. The second part, an important part, uh, point is that you must read the platform policy. And probably the most important point is that you must read the platform policy that Facebook offers. Now, it's not that complicated. It's, it's not one of those, those book-looking ones. If you look here, this is an actual screenshot of the policy. Uh, it's got bullet points, easy to read sentences. It'll take you like 10 or 20 minutes to read the whole thing, and it'll give you an overview of what you can and can't do on the platform. Because if you develop out um, a, a 10 grand app on this thing, and then you launch it, and Facebook's like, well, that violates this, this, and this, shut down, and then, yeah, your, your client's gonna be really not happy with you. I can't tell you how many times a client sends me ideas that violate at least three of those things. And I'm like, dude, you're gonna waste a ton of money. And I've saved them an untold amount of money just because of that. Okay, congratulations, you're officially a Facebook developer. That didn't take too long. Now, let's create a Facebook app, because that's kind of important. Go back to facebookdevelopers.com, and in that little My Apps tab, you'll see, not all these apps, those are some of mine, um, you'll see a new tab down here at the bottom. It says, add a new app. So you click on that, and it'll pull up this, uh, this little selection thing here. This is actually kind of new. This didn't used to exist a couple months ago. But uh, this is, are the different, these are the different platforms that you could uh, integrate with with your Facebook app. For now, we're just going to select website because this is what will allow us to uh, integrate Facebook login with our website, for example. It'll ask you a couple questions, and then bada boom, bada bang, you got a Facebook app. Boom. That's, that wasn't too hard. Like, it's really super easy to make a Facebook app. But having it do something is a, quite a different story. If you look on the left-hand side here, uh, there's a tab called Settings. And in the settings, uh, you can see a little bit more information about your app. So, the anatomy of a Facebook app. Let's look at what a Facebook app has. Lots of things, but we're going to boil it down to a couple things here. You have the core attributes, which, by the way, is not an official term. That's just the term I'm using to describe like kind of the, the, the most required uh, uh, aspects of a Facebook app. And you also have the platforms that you can integrate into with your Facebook app. So let's look at the, the, the core attributes of a Facebook app. First, you have the ID, the name, and the secret. <laughs> and those attributes can be found right here under the settings. Um, you see here's the ID, there's the app secret, and there's the name. All right. So the name is created by you, for example, my awesome app. Um, and I don't think it can contain words like Facebook and things like that, um, but it'll tell you if you're naming something wrong. But it's just whatever you want to call it. App ID is a, un a numeric identifier generated by Facebook. It's a long one. Um, and it doesn't have to be secret. You actually use this uh, in the when you initiate the uh, JavaScript SDK. It looks like that. That's, that's an actual ID of one of my apps. And then finally, the, the Facebook secret, the app secret. Um, it, this is created by Facebook. It's a really long, crazy string. Uh, and it's used to validate data from Facebook, to, to make sure that the data you're getting is actually from Facebook. It's a key that you validate against. But it's a big secret. You cannot show it to anybody. Like, it's, it's a big, bad deal. If somebody gets your Facebook secret, they'll be able to fake data um, and send it to your app and make it seem like things are going on when they're really not, and they'll be able to snoop on you, and lots of bad things can happen. So cover that thing up. Don't let anybody see it. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Facebook platforms. What can we integrate with? Well, you can integrate on a website, a canvas, mo native mobile apps, a page tab, and we're not going to get into this, but you can also integrate into console apps like Xbox and PlayStation. So under app settings at the bottom here, there's the add platform button. When you click on it, it shows you all the platforms that you're able to integrate with. You notice it's a little different than the one that you started with um, when they originally asked you. So like page tab isn't on this one, um, for example. So for a website, we want to add login with Facebook. So we're going to choose the website platform. This is the box that would pop up, right? If you're going to do integrate, you're going to integrate with uh, Facebook's login. Um, if we were going to do like an app canvas, that's something like Farmville, like something that would be used within the context of Facebook's page here, right? So this is one of my clients and the uh, app I did a long time ago. Uh, now Canvas, it seems like really complicated, right? Like what, is your, what language you write it in? Like who's hosting it? Well, you are, and whatever language you want. It's basically just a glorified iframe. This is the entire code that runs your, your Canvas app, essentially. So what, let's move on to page tabs. Um, with If you look at like, any kind of page, Facebook page here, these little tabs here, right here, um, this section right here is totally customizable. It's basically the same thing as an app Canvas, only happening within the context of a page. And it's the same exact source code. It's just an iframe. So nothing special. So really, 
believe it or not, at the core, of these things are really simple. It's just all this other stuff that, all these terms and things that are, seem to be really daunting, I think, and get people kind of confused when they're integrating Facebook stuff. Mobile apps. Uh, native, for, if you do native mobile development, um, you're going to want to configure your app for native mobile stuff. Now, you guys have unlocked another achievement, and you guys are doing great. Uh, this one, oh, this is my favorite one. This is a super neat Facebook developer hat. I actually wore mine the other day. It's just, it looks really, really hot. So I wish they made those in real life. By the way, do you guys remember this? Um, this right here? Do you, you remember it? That, Neil deGrasse Tyson. That one? Neil deGrasse Tyson, yes. <laughs> I think he's in there. I think he's in there. Oh, wait, no, it's a secret. You can't show that stuff. You don't show it to anybody. Seriously. Seriously, do not show your Facebook app. Don't show your Facebook app secret. Don't do it. All right, one last thing before we start coding. Understanding Facebook login. Understanding the flow. So basically what happens is a user clicks on a link, Facebook asks that user to approve some certain permissions, and then an access token is granted to your app so that you can make requests to the Graph API on behalf of that user. So if that sounds like crazy and confusing, that's right, we're gonna go over that real quick. What is an access token? It looks like that, and kind of like that too, but this is, this is what it actually looks like. And this is a truncated version of an actual access, access token. So an XX token is sent with every API request that you send to Graph. So um, I'm sending this get request here, and I'm appending this access token uh, parameter with the actual access token. Now, if you're using one of the SDKs, you won't have to worry about appending that because it'll happen for you automatically. Now, access token, token represent three things. They represent a user, a Facebook user, a Facebook page, and a Facebook app, like the one you just created. Now, the user and the page access tokens have to be obtained by Graph User is obtained by OAuth, and the page is obtained by accessing the admin of that page. This is really confusing because we're not getting into that, so I'm going to skip that part, but just know that those are obtained by Graph. And then an app ID, uh, Facebook, uh, I'm sorry, an app access token is actually generated, and I'll show you how to do it. You concatenate the app ID and a pipe and the app secret. And so, if, for an example, if our app was, uh, ID was 123, our app secret was app secret. Our app, our app access token will look just like that. But be warned, this exposes our app secret. We can't expose that thing. So if we're trying to use, say, send somebody to a link that has an access token in it, we don't want to use an app access token because it has our app secret. And people can do naughty things with that. All right, access tokens have two different types of lifetimes, short-lived and long-lived. A short-lived lifetime uh, lasts for two hours. So after two hours, you won't be able to use that access token anymore. The long-lived access tokens last for 60 days. Now, how does that work? Well, once the user logs in uh, from our app, we just ask for an access token, and if they grant the, the app access, then by default, Graph, the Graph API will return a short-lived access token. But a lot of times, maybe you want to use a longer one. So all you have to do is like, thanks, but I'd really like a longer one. And they're like, okay, here you go. So it's really not that complicated. You just have to make sure that you extend it as soon as you get a shorter one, okay? So now that you have this great new access token that's long-lived, we can make requests to the Graph API. Whew. Sounds complicated, all that stuff, but it's okay But that because that's what SDKs are for. And all right, just a review. So far, we've gone over the Graph API and Graph Theory. We've gone over how to become a Facebook developer. We've, come, we've gone over the anatomy of a Facebook app, and we're going to keep our app secret secret. And we've gone over uh, Facebook login and app size tokens. So the only thing left well, not, not really, but the only thing left in this talk is talking about the SDKs, the software development kits. So there's two official SDKs that we're going to care about for this talk uh, and for most of us uh, most of the time. That is the PHP SDK and the JavaScript SDK. Now, we don't have enough time, unfortunately, to talk about the JavaScript SDK, so we're going to focus most of the talk on uh, the, or the rest of this talk on the PHP SDK. And the PHP SDK is at version 4.1, which is actually a lie, because it hasn't been released yet. Um, the current version is actually 4.0. Um, if you want to use 4.1, it's been completely rewritten over the course of a year, um, and it's, it's much better. I'm just going to say that. It's much better than, than 4.0. I'll just take my word for it. Um, to install it, uh, using your composer.json and adding this to your require is um, Facebook slash PHP SDK version 4. Now, one important thing that I want to point out is that um, in order to install 4.1, since it's still not released yet, it's still in development mode, so you need to add this flag here that says that the minimum stability that you are allow allowing this package to be is development, which you normally would never want to do. But if you want to experiment, it's getting close to, to stable release. 
but there are going to be a couple more breaking changes coming down the pipe. So it's something to play with. It's, I highly recommend it. Um, so here's how it looks. It's namespace with the Facebook uh, namespace, and here's the, the what I call like the super class or the super service class that basically accesses everything that's going on behind the scenes. And you add your configuration as an array here, send in your app ID and your app secret, which you want to make sure that you keep that thing secret. I don't know if I've said that before, but you want to keep your app secret secret. Um, and, and, and as kind of like a best practice, a lot of people are, are sending some of these sensitive variables into in, in, uh, environment variables. So actually, out of the box, the SDK supports these two environment variables. If you have an environment variable called Facebook underscore app underscore ID and one called Facebook underscore app underscore secret, and you have your app ID and your app secret in those, um, those will be used automatically. So all you have to do is just new up a new Facebook super, super service and you're, you're rolling. So it's kind of easy to use. Now here's the problem when we try to integrate into Laravel, right? SDK out of the box has a custom persistent data store, like sessions. So like PHP sessions, people are familiar with that. In Laravel, we have these other ways of handling sessions, right? What if we wanted to use APC, or what if we wanted to use Redis, or something like that? So out of the box, the SDK is going to try to use native sessions. So that's going to be a problem if you're using Redis and you're, 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 you have a multiple distributed computer and all your sort like one request goes to this computer and one request goes to that computer. If you're using native sessions on one of those, sometimes that user is going to be logged in, sometimes they're not, based on which request um, or which server that they they went to on that request. URL detection, it's got some built-in URL detection, but Laravel stuff is better. Um, and then what if you want to use facades, right? Um, there's some other issues there going on, but, uh, but those are the, some of the main ones. So you could do it manually, or you could, I'm going to do a little self-promotion here, you could use my, my package here that integrates all that stuff for you, the Laravel Facebook SDK package. And I'll provide that link in the, in the, the notes at the bottom of the, the video. So basically, it's, it's a Laravel wrapper for the SDK, right? Um, and what it does is it ties into native sessions for Laravel. So if you're using, for example, Redis for your sessions, when you install this package, it will make the uh, Facebook SDK also use um, Redis as your session. It'll do the native URL, URL handling of Laravel. And finally, it'll give you a facade if you want it. Um, I don't know if you roll with facades or not. Um, but here's how you install it. Um, you don't need to require the SDK, the, the official SDK. You just install mine, my little guy here. Um, and also, same thing here. We gotta, ins we gotta require that the minimum stability is gonna be development because 4.1, of the SDK is still in development mode, so this one will also be in development mode until they, they release a stable version. And then uh, finally, you just need to register a service provider. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with installing um, packages on Laravel, but they all follow the same procedure. You basically install it with Composer, uh, you go into your app config, uh, oops, I meant to press the laser pointer, app config slash app. There's an array there with providers, and at the, at the bottom of mine, I just add whichever, whatever, copy and paste, whatever they tell me to put in there. Just blind faith. Uh, and finally, if you want to use the facade, this is an optional step. You can add that to your um, same config file under aliases. Uh, and I've named this facade Facebook, so I mean, it's very creative. So, uh, And finally, uh, to pu publish the config file, it does have a custom config file. You can you know, add your own app ID and app secret. Um, you publish that with the artisan command, um, config dot, uh, double dot push, colon push. And then you give the name of the package. And that is going to generate this really deeply nested config file. It's still under your config file uh, folder, and so you'll be able to find it eventually. Um, but that's normally that's the general setup that when you install a Laravel package, that's some of the processes that you'll that you'll typically run into. And this is how you get to grab an instance of it. You just do app make and then Laravel Facebook SDK. Um, now this gives you a Laravel Facebook SDK instance, but this is extended from the official SDK. So every method that you have on the SDK, you get here. There's no there's no weird things going on there, and I've got it to do to make this look better. So that's just a to do for myself. It's in my code. All right, uh, Facebook login with the Laravel Facebook, um, the, the package that I just showed you. Basically, you generate, uh, you get a login URL. This is just going to return a string, just a, a URL that uh, with all the permissions that you want, um, and then you you would use Blade typically to, you know, return this to the user. But I've just got like plain PHP uh, echoing out login, and the user would click on that and they get redirected to Facebook. However, maybe you want certain permissions, extra permissions. We, we talked a little bit about this earlier, and we don't have time to go into too much detail, but say you wanted the user's email, you've got to define that, yeah, you have to ask the user for that email. Say you want to look at their status updates, you need to define that there. Um, you just basically send an array of permissions, and you can find permissions in the documentation. And finally, uh, this is the callback URL. So after the, URL, the user approves the or denies the request, Facebook will redirect you to Facebook slash login, and that can be configured in uh, your configuration file that we published just a second ago. 
And all you got to do is ask for the access token, this really longly named method here, get access token from redirect, and that returns your access token. Now, one important point, that throws an exception if something goes wrong. So you want to wrap that bad, that bad boy with a try catch. So this is the same exact code, just with a try catch, and it catches this, um, it's actually Facebook exceptions, Facebook SDK exception. And notice that this doesn't say anything about Laravel or anything like this. this is, I let all the exceptions of the native PHP SDK fall through, so you don't have to worry about handling like multiple exceptions. That's really annoying. Um, so once you obtain a, a token, you're logged in. Your user is logged in, sort of. You haven't actually logged them into Laravel yet, but, and that's another topic, but we'll, we'll, we can talk about that in more detail if you're interested. And you've officially made another, you've unlocked another achievement for implementing Facebook login, and that is gold teeth. <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite one, I think. I think I like it better than the hat, but it's, I like gold tea. I don't have any myself, though. So what do you do with this token? Now that you have a token, well, um, there's a couple things you can do with it. Typically, you would store it in a session, um, but if you need to make requests uh, on behalf of the user later on, you'll need to, you'll need to put it in a database. Um, all right, so I think this is the last thing that we're going to be talking about the Facebook stuff uh, for the PHP thing is that we want to grab some user data, right? We're going to get a little bit of data on the user. So as you remember earlier, we were able to get um, data from the Graph API by going to this endpoint, the user's ID, basically. One, two, three. Notice that the version is missing in this URL. We were going to forward slash 2.2, you know, uh, v2.2. We don't have to do that because the SDK automatically version prefix all, prefixes all of our URLs for us. Um, now here we're sending in the token. Oh, sorry, I had a little slide for this. That's the user node, and there's the token. Now, we can set this token, um, and we can send it in for every request that we make to the Graph API, or we can just use this extremely longly named method, set default access token, and then we don't have to use it anymore. Um, we can, every request we make to Graph will fall back to that default access token. Oh, and one last thing on this is that we can define the, the fields that we want to have returned specifically for that node. Because if you don't define the fields, it'll just throw a bunch of data at you, all the attributes and, and um, fields that you can receive with a user node. And you might not want all of them. Now, when you do this, Git is going to return, this is all from the native Facebook SDK, a Facebook response, which is an HTTP response representation, a representation of an HTTP response. So you get methods like get HTTP status code, get the request or the response headers, get the raw response body, decoded body, and decoded body is going to be something like an array, things like that. So this is like an H, this is an uh, HTTP response, pretty kind of basic. So if you want to do something more with that, say you wanted to, like you requested a user node, you want to get something more user nodey looking. Well, you can use this, get graph object, uh, and that's going to return a Facebook slash graph node slash graph object, and that is a collection. Now, there's a like, little gotcha here. Something that's coming down the pipes probably within the next two weeks. Graph object is probably going to be renamed to graph node, so that makes a lot more sense when you're dealing with nodes and edges. You don't want to be dealing with objects and lists, is what they, they're called in the SDK right now. So that needs to change. So we're going to assume that it's going to be graph node from here on. So graph nodes actually extend from a collection that was written by Mr. Taylor Otwell, who also wrote a little bit of a little bit of the code for Laravel. I don't think he wrote that much. But it's actually the same exact collection stuff that you would expect in a Laravel app. So you can do like um, iterations over it, you can have array access. Like if you're familiar with all that stuff, um, you got that and it's really nice to work with uh, responses from graph. Now there's not just user, uh, just a default graph node, you can, there's actually these sub nodes that represent different objects or different nodes on graph, like a graph user. And they're special, um, this is how you would get it from an HTTP response um, from Facebook. Um, here's the graph page, so if you want like a Facebook page node, a graph album, if you want like an album of photos. And these are kind of neat, um, because remember way back when, when we were talking about this user node and it had these IDs, first name, last name, email, and all these edges? With the user nodes um, that we receive from the SDK, we access those fields with these methods here. And interestingly here, this one, get significant other. I didn't even really remember that there was a significant other option on here, but there is a field that Facebook, uh, the, the graph API will return called significant other. And it doesn't contain just like a string or an ID. It returns a node. It returns a user node specifically. So when you get partner and this method, it'll be automatically cast into a graph. Uh, I went too fast there. Uh, it'll get automatically get, uh, get cast as a graph user um, node. So that's kind of nice. So like I, this has been this has been a lot of technicalness going on. So I think we just need a little break to look at something not technical, because this was I, I just I can't get enough of that. So all right, last thing. 
Uh, we're just going to wrap it up real quick with a little look at the Facebook SDK, or the, I'm sorry, the JavaScript SDK, because we really can't talk about the Facebook development platform without talking about the JavaScript SDK, at least a little bit. Um, it lives, uh, for the documentation, it lives at developers.facebook.com forward slash all that. The key word here, though, is developers.facebook.com. That's the key URL you want to hit, and you'll, vent, you'll find the uh, information that you need to get started. Now, all you need to do is take all this crap right here and paste, copy and paste it into your app. Um, it doesn't really matter what all that stuff is except for this part right here highlighted in yellow. And I'm going to blow that up so you can see it. So this is where you configure your app ID and a couple of other set, uh, variables such as like which version of graph you want to use. Now there's one other here um, called a cookie. By default, the JavaScript SDK won't set any cookies on your domain, but it's really cool if you're using the PHP SDK to set a cookie from the JavaScript SDK because when the JavaScript SDK sets a cookie, it contains information about the user who, you've who you logged in with the JavaScript SDK. You can then later access that cookie with the Facebook PHP SDK and grab the information, uh, information about the user without having them go through that whole process we just went through with logging them in. It's a, much, it's a much nicer user experience to use the JavaScript SDK to log a user in than it is to use the PHP SDK. I use them both in tandem. It's a beautiful experience for the user. All right. So the, the, the only thing I wanted to show you about the JavaScript SDK is how to share content on a user's timeline. And that is done by uh, firing the fb.ui. So this is UI for user interface, and you tell it what kind of thing, what user interface you want to fire. There's a couple options here, but this one we want to use the share dialog. And as you can see, we can define a URL that we want to share. Now, that's going to bring up a dialog like this that will allow the user to, to write a message and post their timeline. I'm sure you are all familiar with that. However, something I wanted to point out, Look, this has got a custom image, it's got a custom title, custom description, this has got like some kind of media associated with it. How on earth do you customize that if all you're sending the, the JavaScript SDK is the link, the URL, right? You, in the old SDK, there, there was a the previous version of this SDK you used to be able to define. Here's the image, here's the name, here's the description. But you don't do that anymore. And in fact, this is the only way you'll be able to do it if you already have, I don't know if any of you guys are implementing the JavaScript SDK right now, um, that all this stuff um, is going to be force implemented on April 30th, 2015. So all your stuff's going to break. So sorry, you're going to have to rewrite it. Um, but this is how you got to do it. So how do you customize it? Well, the answer is with open graph meta tags. And if you remember, I alluded to this logo earlier saying that that was an open graph protocol logo. That's what this is for. This is, this is basically a protocol that defines a node within the context of a social graph um, and kind of gives it characteristics. For example, a title. So you can customize the title here. You can customize the description and the image that will show up. And when you, you actually put this on the page that you're trying to share. So anybody who tries to share that URL and they put it on a, a social network that embraces the open graph protocol, um, it will have a nice kind of dialogue box associated with it. Whew. That was a lot of stuff. Uh, that was like, seriously, that was, we're on 356 of 371 slides. So we're going to blow through the last of these. Uh, what did we learn? Well, before you came, you looked like this. And you probably didn't know about the graph API or graph theory. You probably didn't know how to become a Facebook developer. You might not have heard of how the anatomy of a Facebook app and its secrets. You might have not known the, 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 the flow of uh, Facebook login or known much about access tokens. Or maybe even the PHP SDK or the JavaScript SDK. But now look at you. You just, you're, you're prepared for the world, I think. And Euler will be super proud of all of you for getting through all this with the graph theory. Now, here's what, here's what we could have gone into. The graph API, we talked about it a lot. We didn't even scratch the surface of what it has to offer. User permissions, we barely talked about that. There's a whole, the docu this one of the longest documentation pages in Facebook, Facebook's develop, uh, documentation is on user permissions. App Canvas. Farmville, if you want to create Farmville, we didn't even talk about that. Um, page tabs, these are, I make page tabs for a living. This, this is a huge, a huge, huge part of the uh, Facebook development platform. Uh, test user and test apps are really cool because you can create a whole user, like an actual Facebook user, and log in as that user and do whatever you want. You can spam it, you can post crap, and you can test your app, like really hit it hard, and um, none of that stuff will get counted against your account because it's a test user. It's like a sandbox environment for you. And also test apps, which allow you to kind of um, send different apps um, configuration files to different developers so you're not sharing the same app secret and things like that. So that's really nice. And there's tons more, tons more. Real-time updates, all kinds of stuff. Um, but here's the next step for you guys. Just get in there, create an app, and play. 
So you got that developers.facebook.com. That's your entry point. That's all you got to remember from this whole whole talk. And if you're interested and you're really inspired and you want to get dive deeper, the Facebook Developer Conference is happening March 25th and 26th in San Francisco. I'm going. I would love to like split the cost of a hotel. So if you are interested, I would love to for you to come and we we could uh, plane pool and then share the, <laughs> share the hotel. And that's the end. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>
um, you would make decisions on like showing a light gate, which by the way, light gates are dead. Uh, Facebook killed those. So, but that would they would use signed requests to look at the information about the user and the page and the relationships and stuff like that. So, yeah, stuff would break. I guess is the short answer. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> cool. Anybody else got any Facebooky related questions or cool ideas to start off with? What's the most surprising thing in uh, those are policies that are? The, the question is, what's the most surprising um, platform policy? Um, they're really, uh, I, I guess the one that keeps coming up is is, um, is one about what you're able to, uh, and how you're able to incentivize and what you're able to incentivize users to do. So you used to be able to incentivize users to like a page, for example, and there would be, like I just mentioned, a like gate that would be like, like our page to view our content. Well, they changed the platform policy to say you can't do that anymore. You can't incentivize users to like your page, um, and so there's it gets into like this gray area. And I'd love to ask a Facebook platform policy expert on this. Is that sometimes uh, a, an ad agency will want to offer promotion for doing something on Facebook, and that something on Facebook gets kind of blurred on the, in the platform policy. And like, are they able to like really incentivize this action or not? So um, it's a little the gray area. That's probably the most surprising thing for me, but. Um, surprisingly, the stuff that surprises me is not necessarily the platform itself, but what I'm asked to do on the Facebook platform from some of these clients. And sometimes they'll ask to do things that are very spammy. And I'm like, how did you, like, I mean, I could point to the platform policy where that's stupid, but I could just tell you now that that's spammy and awful and stuff like that. So that's that's kind of <laughs> probably more surprising than the platform policy itself <laughs> to me, at least. I have a comment that I repeat in the microphone. Your presentation was amazing. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thanks so much. Yeah, I love all the artwork. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I was done with my little trackpad. I'm like, I like make a line. It goes over there. I'm like, ah, control Z. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so much. Any other questions or anything? Yeah. Thanks, guys.